I'm just, uh, again, excited to hear from you. Speaking and through us, Father, Lord God, I ask and pray, Lord, you would you, uh, truly the words that I would speak would be from, from you, Lord God, not out of self. And it would be for the edification, Lord God. Lord, as the, the body comes together to glean from one another. So, Father, I pray that um, more of you could come forth out of today in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so sometimes you get up here and it's like, you get all this message and it just, just, just leaves you. It's like, what am I going to talk about? I have no idea what I'm going to talk about. Uh, that's why I write things down. So last week, Brian's message uh, pondered our history and destiny, which is really good. I really liked it. Um, the blessing that the Lord has for us. And what a blessing it is just to be born in America. Have we ever thought about that? Just stopped and, you know, salvation is, you know, the ultimate, but just, just being born in a free country and born with, you know, uh, just the favor that the Lord has on America, being born in a country that has the favor of the Lord upon it. And that's a blessing in and of itself. Um, and the freedom to worship and the freedom to praise Him. Because... It's not like that in other countries. It's not like that in most other countries. And um, having access to any book and to order any Bible that we want, um, all, a lot of countries aren't like that. So what a great um, opportunity that we have living in America. But with great responsibility, which is kind of what we have, we've got access to all these things, therefore we're responsible now. And what are we doing with it? What are we doing with it? So let's turn to Luke 10, 23 and 24. The scripture says, He turned to them So Jesus, you know, speaking to his disciples privately, said, Blessed are the eyes which see the things that you see. For I tell you, many prophets and kings have desired to see those things in which you see. They have not seen them. And to hear the things that you hear, but have not heard them. So what a tremendous blessing it is. Sunday after Sunday, week, you know, even during the week, we have to hear and to see and to read about our living God. That is a tremendous blessing. Absolutely tremendous blessing. So we're going to watch a couple of videos. First one's from, from China. And the things we take for granted. So we're going to watch some videos. This is a rural area of Henan province in China's heartland. The nearest city is about an hour's drive away. People here are poor, earning less than 150 US dollars a year from their wheat and corn crops. Many of Henan's 3.8 million Christians live in remote rural areas like this and find it very hard to get Bibles. That is why hundreds of people from the surrounding areas flocked to the church in this small village when they heard that a Bible distribution van would be visiting. The van was welcomed into the village like a celebrity.
Bible Society representatives handed out 700 Bibles to rural Christians. For many, it was the first Bible they had ever owned. For many of the Christians who are owning the Bible for the first time, especially in the villages, in the rural areas, yeah, you could see tears in their eyes, you could see you know, joy uh, and gratitude. Yeah. Some of them would come up to me and to us to thank us for giving this precious gift of the Bible. I mean, I've met people who have been waiting for the Bible for the last 10 years, 14 years, and uh, they are precious, yeah. We can go the one for Indonesia now. Traffic advisory, Mike Alpha Delta from Sintani to Corpo, now crossing the ridge uh, just above Sela, maintaining 1,2,000. There'll be a big party when we land. They'll be dancing and singing, and it'll be pretty amazing. <laughs> The one pastor had said, it says in, in the Gospel of John that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And Jesus is that Word, and Jesus is coming, and we need to be there to meet Him. Well, thanks, Jim. I mean, when... Just blew me out of the water. I thought, Lord. We take so much for granted here. Absolutely take so much for granted. And the countries of the world just are clamoring to have the Bible in their own language. And many of the church today, it just sits on the shelf, gathering dust. So once we see God's heart, God's heart's not just for us. God's heart's for everybody. Even our enemies. Hello? God loves our enemies. Even those that persecute us, God loves them. Just think of Saul. Saul's the, I mean, one of the main person we go to. We talk about this. God's touched him. God can touch our enemies as well, those that persecute us. Our nation needs God, absolutely needs God to break in. And I think he's about to, absolutely think he's about to. And, and I want to show us as we go through here uh, the story of, go back to, 
Pharaoh and the Egyptians, but what God is after. A couple of Sundays ago, I talked to the, the, the children about uh, Nineveh and Jonah. And Jonah absolutely despised Nineveh. Didn't want anything to do with them because they were a perverse people, absolutely perverse people. And we have perverse people here in America. We have absolutely nothing we want to do with them. God is love. Larry sang about it. Even though the atrocities that America is doing, God still has a plan for America. God still wants America. America still has a destiny. The church in America still has a destiny. Will we wake up and, and be a part of that destiny? So God loves our enemies. Even the most filthiest, perverse individual, God loves them. Jonah ran from God. Jonah tried to hide from God. Jonah tried to forsake that call that the Lord had upon him. At every turn the Lord intercepted him and finally he went to Nineveh. And guess what? He preached, he told them in 40 days, if you do not repent, if you do not relent, uh, and turn from your wicked ways, God's going to utterly destroy you. What they do? The king, got word got to the king, man, he sat cloths and ashes, declared, decreed a fast to turn from their wicked ways. Right? To repent unto the Lord. Now, he just didn't say it for the people. This is the extent that the king went. He says, don't even feed your livestock. Your livestock's not going to have food. Don't even feed. We're going to call it such a fast. We're going to call it, man, the, the Lord has made this decree against us. We're going to put on sackcloth. And maybe his anger will subside from us. That not even the beasts of the field, the cows, the sheep could not even eat. And guess what? The Lord's anger subsided. Was Jonah happy? Jonah was furious. I think in chapter 4 it says, Jonah was angry at God. You know, we, we just cannot have that same, you know, but, but we do. We live, you know, unfortunately we have our own will. And that's what the Lord is after. The Lord's after our own will. He's after us. It doesn't end at salvation. That's just where it starts. That's where the life in Christ starts. But He's after not just our spirit. Our spirit was made alive. Our spirit is finished. But now He's after our soul realm. Our mind, our will, and our emotions. He's after us. Will you and will I do what the Lord is calling us to do? Even when we don't want to do it. Even when we don't like the people that we are supposed to do, be doing things for. Amen? Yep. We've got to die to self. He is after all of us. He wants our will. He wants when the Lord comes to us, go here, go there, go do this, do that. It's instantaneous. Our life is in Christ. Our life is hidden in Christ. We're that vessel that we're filled with Him. Whatever He says, when He, when he says move, we move. We don't argue. We don't talk back. We don't justify we don't bargain all the stuff that we have done. We bargained with the Lord. We've, we've shifted the blame to somebody else. Well, that's, that's their responsibility. That's for them to do. That's not me. Well, I need, I need this money for this. Or I, you know, I don't got time to do this because I've got to do this. All right? We 
don't stop and say, okay, Lord, whatever it takes. Your will be done. Not my will, your will be done. So what is he after? He's after us. He's after our soul. He's after us, our will, to be conformed to his image. So that what has been accomplished in heaven can be accomplished in us. It has to an extent because we're saved, right? We're saved. But that's not where it ends. That's just, again, the beginning. So let's look at this. Let's see the parallel. And I had never seen this parallel until this week. Until this week. That my eyes were open to this. And this, I don't know, maybe some of y'all already knew this, you know. But for me, I'm just now getting this. So we know about, and I've even talked about God hardening the Pharaoh's heart because he was doing something. Again, he wanted to set the Israelites free. So not only is he showing his people and helping to, per, to perform his destiny he has for the sons of God, he's wanting to also save the Egyptians. Again, God is love. He loves everybody, even the Egyptians. So in the midst of the ten plagues, um, four or five times, Exodus 9, 12, 10, 1, 14, 4, 14, 8, 14, 17, talks about all these times that the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. That he was, just, just go. Moses just, just he, he's, he's, he'd had enough. Just go. Because there are several of them that the magicians were able to duplicate. You know how magicians are. I'm not sure. But it also told you the power, shows you the power of the soul realm too. I'm not sure how much was harnessed in there. How much they were able to do in demonic activity. But some of the plagues they were able to kind of duplicate. Whatever. But for the most part he's like look. You and your people go. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. Because the Lord was not done exposing the gods of the Egyptians. Who they were worshiping, you know, and, and he's done that in America. Through this plague that, ha, that we're currently under, he's brought down how many different, you know, God of sports, the God of entertainment, the God of this. I mean, hello, he is hitting, but he's not done. And that's the piece I missed. I thought when he was done with the ten plagues, it was, it, was, it was done. He wasn't finished. So finally, the Pharaoh finally relents, lets them go. The Lord doesn't harden his heart yet. The people are leaving the Egyptians. And by the way, they also were able to plunder the Egyptians. Did you all know that? Yeah. They took their, their silver and stuff. And silver means redemption, by the way. Redemption was coming. Uh, so they were able to plunder Egyptians, but also Egyptians went with them. There were a lot of Egyptians that saw, you know what, this is the one true God. And that's what God was after. So then they were able to depart. And we know that they ended up, and again, God is orchestrating all of this. I hope we know this. So who's to say that God is not orchestrating what is currently going in our country right now? To bring about what only God can see about what is God going to do and how God is going to expose things. That's what he's after as well. He's going to make an open display that the people of this country and all the nations of the earth will know that there is one God. That's what I'm believing. That's what I'm trusting in. And that's what I'm seeing through the scriptures as well. 
So he takes them to this place. And they're wondering about, wondering about. And he takes them into this place where there is no escape. You can't move to the left. You can't move to the right. And right in front of me is the Red Sea. And here behind me comes the Egyptians. Because again, the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. And the servants, or his soldiers, excuse me, soldiers. And they went after the Israelites. They're hemmed in. And see, I just think he just, just performed a miracle, right? I just, I just think he just, you know, and that was the end of the story. Performed a miracle, parting of the Red Sea. Who's to say that this event right here wasn't what he was after the entire time? And I think it is. Like I said, before, before I had, uh, this week, I had never seen this before. In Exodus 14, 2, you shall camp in a place where there is no escape. He didn't say that, but I'm just saying that's, that's, that's what I, my, my two cents there. So he made them camp in a place where there was no escape. There was no other answer but God. And that place was the Red Sea. And what the scripture now tells us is that on the other side, opposite of where they were was this mountain on the other side of the Red Sea. And that mountain was called Baal Safan. It was a secret place. It was a hidden place. Starting to ring a bell. Things that are hidden. Things done in secret. Where Baal, obviously we know what Baal is. Jezebel worshipped Baal. And then the Zephon. Zephon was known as the god of the north wind and god of the sea. So Pharaoh didn't really need the Lord to harden his heart because Pharaoh sitting where he was, seeing them down in a valley, seeing the Red Sea, and seeing his God, which was God of the sea, knew, oh, the Israelites are in trouble. I've got them now. But we know the end of the story, do we not? And oh, by the way, um, this pagan god is also in Roman term time known as Zeus which was supposedly, I don't know how it all works, the son of Dagon. Is that now giving us a context of America? Mm. Yeah. What's coming down over America? That's right. God's going to have his way. And so God made a show of this pagan God. And this was interesting as well, since he was also known as the God of the North Wind. There came a strong wind of deliverance that parted this, the Red Sea. It didn't come from the north. It came from the east. Again, making an open display to Pharaoh, which Pharaoh did. Pharaoh did confess in Exodus 14.4 this is the one true God. This is what God was after. To bring, to bring an entire nation to its knees. To bring an entire nation to know who the one true God was. Amen? So God showed both the Egyptians and the Israelites who God is the one true God. 
And I want to compare that not only to America, but also our salvation experience. It's very similar to being saved, in essence. You know, you could say it's our, the, the Passover I'm not saying this for a fact, I'm just saying you can draw some similarities here. That the Passover lamb obviously represents salvation, those who receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And going through the Red Sea could be, again, related to baptism. So here, the Israelites were saved, in, in essence, and brought through baptism, in essence. And now... They've been delivered. They sang. We, we read what they sang. And now they're in the wilderness. We as Christians, when we become saved and come to know the Lord as our Lord and Savior, it's not the end. Is it? It's not. It's not. It's the beginning. And this was their beginning. They had not made it to where? The promised land. In the promised land, if we want to move forward for all those who believe, is God's holy kingdom. We're not there. What's it going to take for us to be a part of God's holy kingdom? We know it's to be overcomers. What do we have to overcome? Our flesh, right? Or this world. We have to overcome those who overcome the world. Those who overcome their soul life. That's where... That's where we see the Israelites as a picture of that in the Old Testament. That's where they currently were. Now you would think, um, that after seeing all that the Lord had done for them, all that the Lord had done, you would think that the people would be men and women of faith, right? Well, they didn't have water to drink. And they complained. They complained. Why now have you brought us up from Egypt to kill us? Boy, men and women of faith, right? Is that not like the church? All right. We get in difficult situations and we start complaining. We start we start bickering. We start getting angry with the Lord. Again, it's what we kind of talked about is things start happening. Then we, then we start, it's, it's your fault. No, no, it's your fault that we're in this situation instead of what? Trusting in the Lord. Trusting in the Lord. Abiding in the Lord. He wants us to abide. Abide in the Lord. Again, he is after our self-life. He wants to crush it. He wants to bring heaven because in heaven it is finished. He wants to bring heaven inside of us. It is finished. He wants to finish the work in us. What has been started, he wants to bring it into it. All right, so again, I had never seen 
you know, before this week, God opened my eyes to God dealing with the pagan stronghold, the God that was over, the God that no one saw on the mountain. And the mountain is where they like to, they want the high places. Demons like the high places. So he made an open spectacle of that one. But that wasn't finished. Now they're in the wilderness. And guess what? Now you've got something else coming along. And that's what we're dealing with in our, in our daily lives. Now they're dealing with Amalek. The name Amalek refers to the nation's founder. And, and get this, the grandson of Esau. The one who sold his birthright for a cup of stew. So the one who wanted to satisfy his self, his flesh, is now coming against the people of Israel. So in Hebrew terms, Amalek also means, or the Amalekites, also means city of the world. What are we battling? Just curiosity today. The world. So here you have the clash. Here you see the clash between the world, the city of the world, and the city of God. Right? Amalekites versus Israel. And what we're dealing with as well today. Exodus 17, 14 says, Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this in the book as a memorial and recite it to Joshua. So we know the, the story of the battle. So they got in a battle, and as long as Moses held up the staff, they were able to defeat the Amalekites. But when his you know, arm waned, you know, the Amalekites started winning. And so they held up Moses' arms until the Amalekites were defeated. All right? So again, our battle, our battle, right, is against the self-life, against the flesh, against our experience that we're experiencing here in the world. So the Lord said to Moses, write this in the book as a memorial and recite it to Joshua, that I will, are we getting this? I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. When Jesus died on the cross and rose on the third day, he completed that. It is finished. The name of Amalek and every other demon has been put away from heaven. But we're not in heaven. But in heaven it's been done. Can it be done in us? As long as we allow it to be. As long as we allow heaven, which is Christ, and the fullness of Christ, dwell in us in fullness, it'll be finished in us as well. Amen? Amen. Amen. That is exactly what the Lord is after. So in verse uh, 15, Moses built an altar and named it, The Lord is my banner. And this is really interesting because there's, how can we describe that? The Lord is my banner. banner. Jehovah, I forget, Jehovah is it Nisi? Nisi? Nisi, right? Jehovah Nisi. So the Lord is my banner. You know, and... How can you depict that? Well, if you, if you understood when they went into battle back then that when they rode out to battle, 
they would carry all these banners. They would carry the banner, not of just their own nation, but every nation that they conquered, they rode with that banner. So when you saw a group of people coming against you, and you saw all the cities or all the nations that they had conquered, riding in a row, you're like going, all right, we need a, we need a treaty here. What, what do we do? You know, all right? Because it showed you how strong that enemy was that was coming against you. Yet the Lord is my banner. Why? Because he has all the banners. Amen? And the only trophy that I can, can give you that signifies that is uh, baseball. Baseball has a trophy. Tr trophy. It's, it's round and it's got all these little, little flag poles. And it has flags of all the, diff all the different uh, teams. So it's showing you I've, we've conquered all these teams. So that is the Lord our banner. The Lord our banner is he has conquered all of our enemies. In verse 16, now here as it applies to us. Now again, in verse 14 it says that the name and the memory of Amalek is utterly blotted out. That's what was stated in verse 14. In heaven. Let's see what it says in verse 16. And he said, the Lord has sworn, the Lord will have war against Amalek from generation to generation. Now how can he totally be put away and yet we're going to struggle with him from generation to generation? Because again, in heaven, everything's been accomplished. We just have to have that manifested here, manifested in us. But we're going to battle the city of the world from generation to generation. We're battling them now. We're battling the world now. And it's getting ugly. Absolutely. But the Lord is our strength. And the Lord wants to do it in and through us. He wants that work to be completed in us. In 1 Corinthians 13.10 It says, but when the perfect comes, the partial is done away. When the complete work of Christ comes, the partial work is done away with. That's our prayer. That should be our prayer. For the complete work of the cross be done in us. Our wills be put away. Ephesians 4.13 Until we all obtain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to the mature, complete man to the measure and the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. That must be done in us. It can't be done in part. He has to have us in fullness. But there's something in the way. And the only thing that can stop it is us.
Unfortunately, we want what we want. We have rights. Don't we? No, yes we do. But when someone starts to come against us, guess what happens? Yeah. That part of us which is, doesn't belong to the Lord start to act, starts to act up. We've got to yield. Yield the members of our body to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. It sounds simple. It sounds easy. It sounds, I mean, we will be tested in this every day. And I want to encourage you to not to get discouraged. Because the Lord, once we start down this road, once we've opened our hearts and our lives to the Lordship and asked for a greater impartation of His Spirit, more of the love that the Father has for the Son, the Son has for the Father to be in us, which is Him. We know that's Him. The more we ask for these things, He will answer our prayers. And part of answering our prayers is to expose, expose, expose. See, we're praying, <laughs> we're praying that for our government. We're praying it for everything else, but we ain't praying it for ourselves. All right? That's where it's got to start. And he does start exposing. And he shows us, as he showed, you know, I mean, many times in the scriptures, oh, how wick, wicked man that I am. And Paul's saying, man, I am the chief of sinners. When you start down this path, we see how wicked we really are. And we see how wicked our hearts are. The scriptures tells us that. We want to believe it. The Old Testament speaks it. I don't remember the verse, but it says, our hearts are deceitfully wicked. And we think we're doing things for the right things. And, and we're doing things you know, we're not saying we're getting, we're getting something for it or getting honor or getting praise, but that's really why we're doing stuff. Or we do seek praise because who doesn't like their name called, right? I mean, come on. Who doesn't like, you know, Larry, you're doing a great job. Who doesn't like to hear that? So when we start down this path, when we are down this path, but on this path, I just want to encourage you because, you know, I, I did read this from others that, you know, books that other people that have gone down this path, is that we will, the Lord will do it. And, and I want to encourage us not to get into condemnation because it's absolutely not condemnation. The Lord is not absolutely saying, I told you you weren't good. No, that's not what the Lord is doing. The Lord is exposing so you can get rid of these things. He's exposing so you can have more of him. That's why he's exposing these things. It's not out of punishment. It's out of making you feel bad or feel sorry or that he's disappointed with you. No, he's exposing these things so you can have more of him. That's why he's doing it. That's the love of God. That's why he brought all these plagues upon the Egyptians. to expose themselves, to expose what they were seeking after was not God. He wants you to seek after God, him and him only. He is a jealous God. And partial servitude is not what he's after. All or nothing. Just like all the tests that God gives. It's pass fail. There is no 70% passing. 80% passing. The 
Well, how much is good enough? 75%, 85%? No. It's 100% or nothing. Because the Lord is not going to be married to anything that is not himself. And if you are not 100% consumed in the fullness of Christ, we will not be married to Christ. I'm not trying to be mean. That's an absolutely true statement. All you got to do is look at Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve. Adam was formed from the earth. Eve was formed from Adam. Adam would not be married to anything that was not of himself. No other creation, no other thing of creation could Adam marry other than what came from himself. That is a picture of the bridegroom king and his bride, which is us. We were born from Christ. We have the seed of Christ. Christ wants to bring that seed to fullness so he can marry us. Amen? That's beautiful. That's absolutely beautiful. So as we're on this journey, let's not get condemned. Let's not point fingers and say, you know what, I don't struggle with what my you know, sibling or someone else struggles with. I'm better off than they are. So, are you like Christ yet? Because the New Testament, that's what it says. He is our measuring stick. We have no other measuring rod. You have no other individual or measurement to measure your stature in Christ other than Christ himself. So let's not start looking at this left and to the right, and I'm better off than they are, or we get jealous because this person has something we don't have. The pettiness. We've got to get rid of the pettiness. When we start in a conversation that starts to lead to an argument, we've got to, we need, all need to stop. And is this glorifying the Lord? Am I mean, because it seems like the Lord is exposing something here. And it probably is something that you've got to deal with, you know. He's after our will. He's after our soul, our mind, our will, and our emotions. He's after our minds to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And if it's not of Christ, we don't need to be dwelling on it. The enemy loves us to dwell on things that's not of the Lord. Loves for us to do that. That'll bring in worry, that'll bring in doubt, and then it'll turn into fear, and so on down the road. Where true love, agape love, casts out fear. That's the word used, agape. True love, agape love, casts out fear. Worry, doubt, and unbelief. Don't worry what this world can do to you. Don't fear what this world can do for us, to us. But we fear the one that gives life, not the one that can take it. And I guarantee we all struggle with that. We still all struggle with that. You know, as, as strong as we are in the Lord, as mighty as we are, you know, you out there in the parking lot at night, you know, we still have some of that in us still. The Lord wants to get it all out. Amen. And the Lord's got to do it. I mean, don't think it's works that's going to do it. All right, don't think it's, hey, i got to read the Bible ten times a day, which is good, or pray ten times a day, which is good. Um, but if the Lord's not in it, um, 
You know, it's, it's, it's don't think that works. Because like, again, there's, there's some of us that probably come from a works mentality that can tell you that that doesn't work. All right? Then we can bargain, well, God, I did all this for you. Then you need to do something for me. Mm, no, it doesn't work that way. You can't garnish favors from the Lord as much as we like to think we do. Because I guarantee it's going to leave you in one place, and that's bitter. And that's jaded, and that's offended with God. I promise you, that's where that road leads. Been there, done that. So it's not of works. We read the scriptures because we love the Lord. We pray to the Lord because we love the Lord. Out of our love for Him, we don't do them out of obligation. I'm not obliged to do these things. It's going to benefit you zero because you're not doing them from where? Out of Christ. He doesn't want us doing things for Him. He wants us to do things from Him. Amen? From the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding but all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct thy path. Create in us, Lord, a a clean heart and renew a steadfast spirit within us. Be still and know that I am God. I just want to say that because the being still requires, actually, our minds to be active. Actively being still. Actively not thinking about other things. It's very difficult to get our minds to be still. So that's what you actively have to have your mind focused on the Lord. There's one other thing before we close, and this has probably absolutely nothing to do with, um, I was talking to someone, I have no idea how I'm going to fit this in, but that's just what something that the Lord was giving me. Um, that we need to, to pray about, and it came out of, I think, when Terry Bennett was here. And it's interesting the things that just kind of stay with you. Um, and this one just really you know, ministered to me, I guess, or when he said it, it's like my spirit is kind of, and then it's, it's, and it's, and it's there. Um, and he said that, that, um, 
I'm going to try to get his word. But I don't, I don't think I have his words exactly. Um, is that we are not allowing people to grow up. And that probably applies mostly to, to family members. Uh, but it could be members of the church as well. And part of that, I'm sure, because he didn't expound upon it. He just kind of just threw that out there and just kind of just and went on to something else. I mean, it's just really interesting. But, um, but sometimes you just feel like he says these one-liners and you think it's just he's speaking directly to you. I know it's not just you or me he's speaking to. He's speaking to whomever is listening. But some of it hits certain people and some things don't hit certain people because some people struggle with this, some people don't. That uh, we've got to allow family members, we've got to allow friends, we've got to allow people that we go to church with grow up. In other words, don't see them the same way that we saw them 10, 15 years ago. Allow them as we should be currently viewing them as hopefully matured more in the Lord. How many times you go to family reunions and say, oh, I remember when you were just so, you used to blah, 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 blah. Dude, I'm, I'm 54 years old now. Right? Allow someone to grow up, mature in the Lord. Because, I mean, think about it. Jesus was not allowed, couldn't even minister in his own hometown. That's kind of what he's alluding, Terry, I think, was alluding to. But I think it's, it's you know, here as well. In, in today's time, is that, hey, weren't you that little boy, 12-year-old boy that used to run around with so-and-so and so-and-so? Not that here's the, savior, <laughs> here's the Savior of the world trying to teach you something, and you can't hear him. So let's, one, I think we also need to let go and let God don't harbor because in the church, sheep bites hurt. All right? We're sheep. The instance we're sheep. And other people in the church are also sheep and they could bite us and that hurts, right? We can get offended and members of the church could do something wrong against us, right? And we could hold a grudge and we never let that person grow up or release that person from that. We've got to make sure we're allowing that to happen. Don't hold on to offenses because it's only hurting you. It's not hurting the other person. I promise you there as well. The scripture is clear on that as well. You don't forgive, the Lord's not forgiving you. You're hindering your walk with the Lord. So let's just let everybody go. Can we do that? All right, let's, just, let's stand up. And as I pray this, hopefully this is a prayer of your heart as well. Because we're going to let go of things today. So Father, Lord God, we are truly thankful for the work that you are doing in our midst, in us, in us. And Lord, I confess that you do not have all of me yet. And Father, I am desiring today to make a commitment to you today that Lord, that even the, this coming weeks and days ahead, that if you bring something to my mind that I am holding on to, that I'm holding someone in bondage of, that there is some kind of soul tie attached to any individual for any reason other than you, 
that you would break that in Jesus' name. By the blood right of the Lamb, I pray you would break that soul tie. I pray you would break, Lord God, the unforgiveness. If there is resentment, if there is jealousy, if there is pride, Father, all the aspects of the flesh and of the world, Father, I pray you would break them off now by the name and the blood of Jesus. Father, if there's anything that I'm not forgiven myself of, Lord, if there's anywhere where I'm blaming you for my circumstances of where I currently am in life, I ask forgiveness for that. I repent of those things, Lord. For you are a good God. You are the all-knowing God. And you've brought me to the place where you want me to be. I'm not resentful that I don't have what my neighbor has anymore. I don't look at the things of this world as I once did as something to gain. Father, I pray that we would count it all as rubbish as to knowing Christ. That, Lord, nothing would hinder the work of the cross in my life from this day forward. I would freely yield. That I would not question, that I would not argue the point. May our response be always yes. And amen. And Lord, that's going to require an increase of faith to get to that point. Father, I pray against condemnation because in this journey, we will fail. Because we can't do it without you. So every time... We shrink back, Lord God, to trying to do things from self and from the flesh. Lord, it be a quick, a quick reversal back to you. That we get back on, metaphorically speaking, that bike, not being condemned of us falling, but we immediately get back and keep running the race you've set before us. Father, Lord God, we long for the day that you say it over us, it is finished. Do it, Lord. Do it, Lord. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.